Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to those online. It's great to be with you this morning to gather together to worship. Uh, If you haven't been here for a while or uh, we haven't met before, my name's Kevin. I'm the pastor here. And if you came last week, then I was just slacking off on a holiday. Uh, But it was very nice. Thank you very much. We enjoyed it very much. Uh, And during this week, some uh, nice stuff has been happening too. Something quite majestic happened, mainly over America this week. There was a moment where they got very excited. Do people know what was happening? It's all over the news. The eclipse. Absolutely. A big uh, statement of amazingness of of God's creation aligning in in a certain way. And uh, we should give praise and thanks to God in all that we see going on all around us all the time. The psalmist uh, always likes to look at nature and uh, to celebrate things uh, that are going on. Uh, He put it this way, shout to the Lord, uh, shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving. Come into his courts with praise. Give thanks to his name and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Our Lord is good. He knows us. He knows what's been going on for us this week. And yet he's been active in everything that's been going on. And so as we gather, let me pray. And then we'll sing two songs of praise to our God. Father, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to gather together today to worship you. Lord, some of us know you really well. Others of us are just at the start of that journey, perhaps even just asking questions at this time. But we thank you that we can gather together and hear the truth about who you are. And we thank you uh, that you have been good to us. No matter whether life has been easy or life is really hard at the moment, you are still good and you still care deeply about us. And your love endures forever and your faithfulness continues through all generations. So as we sing songs of praise, as we hear your word spoken to us, as we reflect on that, Lord, as we uh, encounter your Holy Spirit working in us again today, would you please minister to us and help us to grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing two songs of praise, singing how great uh, God is and remembering all the reasons that we have to praise him. Thanks, John.
Yes, Lord Jesus, we come before you as the one who gave his life so that we might know freedom, that we might know peace with Father God. The one who is not dead but is risen, we say amen with all the angels praising you in heaven right now. All the saints in glory bringing praise and glory to your name, saying all wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever, the one who sits on the throne. And Lord, we're sorry that we have put other things on that throne during our time this week. We're sorry that we've put thoughts on the throne that are bigger than you. We've put feelings on the throne that have overpowered who we say you are. Lord, that we've done actions which don't honour the one who sits on the throne. And Lord, we say we're sorry. We're sorry for those thoughts, words and deeds that we have done. But we thank you that you're rich in love that you're slow to anger, that your abundant mercy flows like a river. And not because of anything we have done, but because of everything, Father God, that your Son has done for us. And so we say, not because of me, but because of you, Lord. We can know that we are forgiven, that we are loved, that we are called children of the Most High God. And no matter where we're at on our journey, we are held by him. And he will never, friends, never let you go. So we praise you, Jesus. We praise you for who you are and who you have said we are in you. And so as we worship you this day, Holy Spirit, we pray for more of your presence amongst us. We pray that you would help us to know you more and to be willing to share you with others, to stand alongside one another no matter where we are, no matter what we've done, because you've called us together as family in you. So Lord Jesus, we give you ourselves and ask Holy Spirit for you to make our hearts more open to receiving from you, to wanting to walk closer with you, that we might bless your holy name this day. In this worship, please accept it as our offering. Amen. Amen. Do sit down. And the men, do you want to come join me? So we would like to uh, introduce you uh, to this person. We'll see if we can make this work between us and Andy, all right? Yeah? I haven't told you what to do. Uh, This is uh, Arlene. Okay, this is Arlene. Say hi hi to Arlene. Absolutely. Arlene is from a place called Brundy. Uh, Now, my question is, uh, and if it's really obvious to you, then you're out of this game, okay? Where is Brundy? Okay, is it Burundi even? Let's say it right. Yeah? What can you do, eh? If you can't locate places, I can't speak. It's even harder, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, So is it in Asia? Is it in Africa? Or is it in Europe? Okay, there are your three options. Africa, Asia, or Europe. I've changed the order just to confuse you. Okay, so if you think it's in Asia, put up your hand now. Nobody. If you think it's in Africa, put your hand up now. Lots of people in the room. And if you think it's in Europe, yes, good for you. Absolutely. (laughs) but it's not right. It is Central Africa. There you go. You won't be able to see very clearly, but it's there where that red arrow is. This is where being online helps you, so you get a better closer up uh, view. And this is one of the poorest countries uh, in the world. Noren, tell us a bit about it. Many families grow fruit and veg, but climate change is affecting millions of people. The world is getting hotter and extreme weather is happening. Too much rain, and then none for ages. Crops are failing and they have nothing to sell. Sounds like a really hard life to live 
and not just because of the climate change, but because of also all the prices of everything, not just in the UK, but around the world, are going up. So everything costs so much more. And only yesterday, the UN and other agencies published a statement saying that in the next couple of months, 55 million people won't be able to afford to eat or to pay for medical treatment. They don't have the NHS over there uh, to get the care that they need just in this country, no, across Central Africa and East Africa. Uh, there's other problems around other parts of Africa as well. Of those, five million children under five are currently not just coming up, but already not getting enough food to eat and therefore are not growing and thriving as God has intended them to. This is fast becoming what they have described as an unprecedented crisis. However, support from local groups partnering with Christian Aid can help. Arlene first learnt knowledge and skills to set up a small saving and loan scheme for her village. And with more help, she was then able to form a business selling uh, peanuts and avocados, which were more sustainable in this new environment. And over time, her story's a long one. She's managed to buy a bike to be able to transport her goods. She's been able to sell them and therefore be able to make a home for herself and her family. She's got access to health care and she's been able to educate her family, something which many at this moment cannot do. Arlene's story is good news. She says, the training helped me to get started and today I still have it on my heart and mind. I intend to pass it on to my children and other groups like ours. It's important that we give back and train those who didn't have this opportunity for the development of our community and our country. The members thank me for the training and the positive impact it's had on their daily lives. Please come to me as they trust me. Here in Burundi, a neighbour is considered a member of the family. Isn't that good news? partnering with Christian Aid. And this is not just a good thing to do, though many people would say it is. This is actually about our discipleship, because God has already told us uh, what to do, that we're to care for all people everywhere and to treat them fairly. Uh, a verse we've done many times before, but it's one that's so important to our walking with God. And if you can read it, I'd like to invite you to say Micah 6 verse 8 with me now. It says... He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Let's read those last four lines again. It says to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Christian Aid Week is on the 12th to 18th of May. How can we help to raise money so we can help more people like Arlene? This is the question for us all. How can we do our part? We are so privileged. Even if we're really struggling, we are still more privileged than a lot of these people out there. We have so much support from our government, even if we don't think it's good support. They don't have anything. And so what I want to encourage you to do, children and young people first, is when you go to your groups, I want you to have or start a conversation about how you could get involved in this. What is it that you could do to help raise money so we can support Christian Aid, partnering with others and help these 55 million amongst many others who need our help? Uh, for us as families or as part of house groups, are there ways that we can respond Okay, uh, as individuals, uh, one person in our church does a plant sale every year and has uh, just uh, told people what, what the charity is. People see it as humanitarian aid in their eyes. For us, it's about being obedient to Jesus and wanting to live out what it means to care for others. So how can we also respond? What is it that we can do? As church, we've done things before but it doesn't mean that we can do them again this year. So what could we possibly do to step into this space and to take responsibility for walking justly, loving mercy, and following our God humbly? How can we be beacons of hope in Warwick and beyond? That's always our question. 
So uh, we're going to sing a song uh, which has actions. If you want to join in the actions, you're very welcome. We're not going to teach them. We're just going to do them, okay, which reminds us of this Micah 6 uh, verse 8. And uh, those who want to come up and help us at the front are very welcome. Uh, Do stand as uh, we sing together. It's on the video, Trevor. Uh, So if we can have a fairly loud sound, that would be helpful to us. morning exercise in. That's great. Well done. One of the ways uh, that we can explore what it looks like uh, to follow Jesus uh, is our deeper conference coming up uh, in a week's time. <laughs> a week's time. Okay. Uh, so it's next Sunday evening. Uh, we're having, uh, well, Ken's going to be with us in the morning, first of all. So that's great. Uh, he's going to be uh, preaching for us. And then Uh, He'll be preaching in the evening as well, taking us deeper into two uh, Bible passages, thinking about what does it look like if Jesus lived your life. And I'd encourage you, as you're able, to uh, come along for 6.30. If you really can't make it, uh, then you can jump on Zoom, but I want to encourage you to be in the space, uh, to be joining in as you can. Uh, And then on the Tuesday, uh, there is uh, the LICC, so that's the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity, which is what Ken works for, whom Ken works for. Uh, It's their vision tour, which is picking up on this theme, but taking it even deeper. It's more interactive in the way it's being uh, approached. Uh, It starts at 7.30, but uh, drinks are on from 7. And they'd love you to come along and to be interacting uh, early. Uh, I still need your help. Still keep, please, plugging it with other people in other churches that you know. Uh, The Tuesday is not on Zoom. The, The Sunday is, okay? So, and you need to sign up for both, please. And if you just go to our website, uh, you'll be able to find out uh, how to do that. 
So let me pray, and then our children and young people are going to be heading out uh, to their groups. If you're visiting and you've not been uh, to a group before or for quite a while, we do need you to fill out a form to make sure that we're caring for your child the best that we can. So please just head out to the lobby with them and we'll sort that out there. So great, Jesus, we just thank you for that reminder that we're to walk humbly with you, but we're to love mercy and we're to uh, seek to love and care for all those in your creation, Lord. Help us to have eyes to see those who are abroad, as well as those who are at home who need us to act justly. And so as we break out into our different groups, we ask that you would inspire us in those conversations, uh, that we'd have great ideas to raise uh, the money that you have already set aside uh, for us to give to Christian Aid. And Lord, would you bless us as we study your word? Would you uh, strengthen us in knowing your love for us? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So children, young people, their leaders, head out that way. If you're not sure, head that way anyway. The groups are on the screen. If you're in year 11 and above and you do want to... Oh, I've gone off the mic, have I? If, if you're in year 11 and you still want to go out to AYP, so if you're in year uh, 12 and 13, that's absolutely fine, or you're welcome to stay in here, whichever is appropriate to you. Well, as they uh, sort themselves out and work out what's uh, going on for them, uh, we're going to sing again and remind ourselves of the faithfulness of our God. Uh, let's, if you're able, let's stand together.
do sit down and as we focus in on the one who is our rock, who is our strength and who is our hope, uh, John's going to lead us in a time of prayers for our world. Are you okay there, John? Yep. Yeah. So, Heavenly Father, as we come before you in prayer this week, I was really spoken to by Psalm 9, verses 8 to 12, which remind us very much of our theme for today. They talk about you being judge in equity over the nations. And Lord, we've already heard today about Burundi and other places in Africa and around the world where climate change, corruption, problems in politics, all kinds of things that are features of our broken world. We just bring those pieces before you, Lord, knowing that you alone are the person, the one who is the rock higher than I, the rock in that thirsty land who can bring them peace and equity in you. And we think today of hotspots of trouble, not only Ukraine, not only Gaza, with the escalation of the uh, fighting in Israel with Iran pitching in as well now. And we know, Lord, that as Paul reminds us, that you are the one new man. You are the one in whom peace is found, not the cessation of violence. Nevertheless, Lord, you remind us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep or to mourn with those who mourn. So we just think of those people who have lost loved ones, homes, livelihoods, everything, whether that be a whole nation or whether that be families like those in Australia where there were these stabbings in Sydney and we know there are all sorts of situations in which even in our own nation where families and communities are not what you would want them to be. So Lord we move from the international scene Lord to maybe other issues like the eclipse that can kind of eclipse our politics that overshadow them. And we just pray at this time where there's not only our country, but other countries, Lord, that are about to go into a time of elections. So we just thank you, Lord, and we trust you, Lord, that the politicians we have and will have in this forthcoming term are the people that you have ordained to be over us. And Lord, you tell us in Romans to respect those who you have put in authority over us unless they want us to do something that goes against your will and your word, Lord. So we just pray that you would give them wisdom, particularly Rishi Sunak and the current government, for the Scottish government and the Irish, Northern Ireland Assembly and the Welsh Assembly, Lord. We just pray that what is right and what is just for those communities will, will follow through, Lord, and that the elections will be attended by as many people so as a democratic outcome can happen as possible Lord and uh, and we just pray for particularly for our young people at the moment you know we've heard about the new kind of hate crime legislation in Scotland and there's new uh, issues that are con of concern for say trans communities and, and identity issues and all kinds of th things like that and Lord we know that the enemy loves to uh, sow seeds of confusion and discord and divide and destroy but lord we just pray particularly for young people all over the country but but those in warwick we're thinking of the 50 young people we've been praying for lord we thank you for the young people in our church but we just pray that somehow our young people would stumble across a path that has your word on it a path that has your lamp, that they would find that to be the light for their feet, that is going to give them the guidance that they need in this confusing and broken world. And we also praise and thank you for our older people and people in work, people of all ages, Lord, that, and we pray that they would find you to be the beacon of hope. And we thank you for churches together in Leamington and Warwick, particularly at times where we've got causes like Christian aid very much in mind and we thank you for the unity that we have in you and we also pray Lord for our own fellowship for Kevin for the deacons and we thank you for the blessings that they are to us and uh, and then finally Lord we think of ourselves 
And I've been so conscious, Lord, that there's so much in the world that we long for comfort from. But, Lord, your comfort isn't taking away the pain necessarily. It's not fixing broken things. It's doing something even more amazing than that. It's being with us in our brokenness. You, were, you came to be broken for us that in you we might find our wholeness in our risen and ascended Jesus Christ that sits rightfully at the right hand of God the Father. So for whatever we need, Lord, as we conclude our prayers, Lord, we just say the Lord's Prayer together in whatever version is right for us. So you say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Bless you. Thank you, John. As we come to uh, think about God's word, I want to ask you a question uh, that uh, I'd like you to have a quick chat with your neighbor about, or if you're online, just post a, a comment in uh, the chat, because I think that each of us has jobs that we really don't like doing, things that we will come up with anything else to do other than do that thing. You all know what I'm talking about? You got something in mind? Okay, tell your neighbours what that thing is. What is it? You might need you to move. That's okay, just take a moment. If you haven't heard the other person swap over, make sure both have said something. Okay. So, uh, I'll do anything to avoid a tax return. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a stereotype there. Um, so that's, that's me out the way. Have we got any obscure ones? Did anyone say something where you went, really, that's what you'd avoid? What did we get, anyone? Pairing socks. Pairing socks. Do anything to avoid pairing socks. <laughs> Lovely, anything else? Anything to do with cooking, avoid cooking. Yeah, there's other people I'm sure who love cooking, right? No, no, there are, so okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad the meet and eat team nodded then. That was, uh... <laughs> yeah, anything else? Any obscure ones? Changing the beds. Avoid changing the beds. Absolutely. Okay. Well, today we're starting a new series following a reluctant prophet who was asked to do a job that he didn't want to do and went to every extreme to avoid doing it. Now, this is a, a, an Old Testament prophet, someone who was called by God to, to see or to hear God's word and to proclaim it then where God uh, sent him. And normally in our books about prophets, we have a collection of oracles, so sayings uh, that they have been recorded that God has spoken to these prophets, but not in the book that we're going to be exploring. Our book is uh, unusual in that it's actually a story about a person, one who is uh, not sent to speak to God's people, but is actually sent to speak to a ruthless, cruel, and oppressive enemy. There you clues. Anyone know who I'm talking about? Jonah, absolutely. Jonah is where we are going. 
And don't be fooled, because even though it's titled Jonah, Jonah is not the primary character that we're called to focus on, and it's certainly not the next four weeks about a smelly fish, okay? There's only three verses which mention the fish or the whale, and you can get in that debate in your house group, okay? This book is primarily about God. This book is primarily about God. And whilst this is set 800 years before Jesus, under the reign of the evil king Jeroboam II of the northern kingdom of Israel, the version that we've got now is probably likely to have been written down uh, sometime after the uh, Jewish people uh, had been into exile in Babylonia in, and had come out again in around the 6th century. And it's, it's written as a way of reminding them of just who their God is. Now, sometimes I've heard people say, yeah, you know, when I read the Bible, what I find is there's the the God of the Old Testament, and then there's the God of the New Testament, right? I mean, there's the the judgy, stern, I want to kill everybody God, I'm going to judge everybody God of the Old Testament, and then we've got the nice, friendly, brown flowing hair, Jesus of the New Testament, right? I assume you've heard this. You may have thought it yourself. And again, As we read this, and I want to encourage you, it's very short, to read it regularly as we go through this series, I hope what you'll find is that the God who we find here is the same as Jesus. The God is same yesterday, today, and forever. That Jesus, who is the good shepherd who seeks after his lost sheep, will also be seen in Yahweh, the God who pursues his creation. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to uh, read and talk about the text as we go together. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for an opportunity so freely in public to explore it together. And as we do, uh, Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit would open our hearts to receive what you have to say to us this day. Lord, that uh, if our brains have just gone to the childish story, that you would help us to see this story with fresh eyes and to receive new from you what your word has to say to us. May you be glorified in all that's done today. In Jesus' name, amen. So do grab a Bible. If you haven't already, do open up an app. I want you to keep it open uh, so that you're able to uh, follow through with me. Are we all roughly uh, in the right place? Yeah? Okay. Uh, So here we go. We're going to start with uh, the first two verses. And I'm reading from the Church Bible. Uh, There'll be different slight edits in terms of what you're reading. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me we straight away see that God's heart is for the city of Nineveh, that God pursues Nineveh. Now, Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. Okay? These are guys who were regularly attacking other nations. They were known in history, read up about them, for their cruel, brutal, evil, inventive treatments of other. They are the arch enemy of most people. If we want to think of a modern way of thinking about this, imagine God has just said to you, go and preach in North Korea. Go and preach in Iran. Go and preach to communist China. How would you feel? And the words that are used in here, the word which speaks about uh, their distress, their wickedness that has come up before God also talks about a distress that they can feel. And so there's a sense that uh, this city is crying out against its wickedness too. Uh, We're told at that time that there was a great famine in the land. And so there would have been much death causing great distress uh, to all the people in those areas. And what we really have to know is that these people are not God-fearing people. They don't give a monkey's about who Yahweh is. And yet into this, 
God wants Jonah to go there and to be his prophet. To judge them, yes, but also to offer them an opportunity to come back to him. That's what his judgment is about. It's about saying, hey, you've gone the wrong way. Turn around and follow me. To move them away from their distress, which all this wickedness, this evilness is causing, and to return to his loving embrace. Now, uh, most parents will uh, be able to relate to an experience uh, like this, or indeed, if you think of yourself as a child listening to your parents uh, speaking to you, uh, then you'll know of that experience where uh, they really long and desire to give you their wisdom. So you might want to do something, and they'll say to you, do you know what, that's not really very sensible. You probably shouldn't do that. Okay? They want to, in their loving way, care for you, to offer you advice, to seek and guide you the best they can. And of course, in our wisdom, what we do is go, (laughs) no God, we're not interested in what our parents have to say, we know best, we're going to get on and do what we want to do. Yeah, anyone got a relation to that? No, their kids are all obedient and it's all fine. Okay, okay, yeah, anyone rebelled against their parents at times? Yes, yes, we've all done it, haven't we? Because we think we know better. Uh, And yet as a parent, we're also delighted and probably quite surprised when our children actually take notice of what we said. Uh, And they see and they go, oh, actually, what you said was right. Actually, that saved me a lot of pain. That saved me a lot of suffering. Now, it doesn't mean that the wisdom that we pass on will remove all the tragedy and pain that they may face. It may be that they've broken up in a relationship and you want to give them the wisdom of your knowledge that and one day you'll find someone else and you want to sit with them in that pain. But what we want to do as parents and as those who receive parent advice from good parents is, is seeking to walk them in the right paths, to help them to know our loving embrace and support, to keep them close so we can help them as best as possible. You know, that's what God longs for with his world. That's why God pursues Nineveh, that he has a heart for this city because he longs for them to be in his presence, to walk in his ways, to know his loving embrace. And we may look around the world at all the evil that's going on and think, you know, God should rain down fire on places like North Korea. There is no goodness there. What good can come from these evil places? And yet notice how God looks on and longs in his mercy for them to turn to him. That there is no city in this world that God doesn't see that he longs to turn to him. God is pursuing Nineveh and longs that our hearts are reflective of his. It's why world mission is so important, why we should be praying for all nations to know the Lord. But don't misinterpret this text too, because Jonah has had a very specific call. And whilst all of us who follow Jesus are called to share him wherever we go and in whatever we do in those specific places God has called us, there are people who are called out by God to go to hard places. And the only way that they can do it is because they know God has spoken, that he is in control, and that this mission will come about because of what he will do. And so our call in that place is therefore to be praying and supporting those who have these hard callings on them. To be standing with them in these hard places and to pray for them regularly. And so what is it that we should pray? Well, the Bible tells us, uh, I'm going to give you four uh, quotes. Uh, So the first one's from Colossians 4, where it says, uh, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message. So our first thing is to be praying that God's message will find a way into people's hearts, that we're part of God's prayer team we're part of that engine room praying for people's hearts to change for him 
Ephesians 6 says, Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. So not only are we praying for the people that the person's speaking to, but we're called to pray for the person preaching, that they would be bold in their uh, encounters as God lays them before them. Uh, And in 2 Thessalonians, two verses from this. Firstly, dear brothers and sisters, we ask you to pray for us. Pray that the Lord's message will spread rapidly and be honoured wherever it goes, just as it was when it came to you. So not only do we open for hearts to be changed and for boldness in speaking, but we're called to also pray that the word will then spread. Now others will turn and share uh, that good news. And in doing that, we're called to pray too that we will be rescued from wicked and evil people for not everyone is a believer. So in those hard places, we're called to pray for those who speak with boldness to be protected by God in those places. Friends, we're called to pray for those who step out having heard God tell them to go to these hard places to love them, to support them, to encourage them, to pray for them, and not just them, but for their cities as well that they have gone. That should be part of our regular practice as disciples in praying for others to know the Lord and those who have gone to share. Because see, God is not just pursuing Nineveh, he is also pursuing Jonah. Let's continue on in our passage and hear what then happens probably what all of us would do. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. It's the entire opposite direction. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he's an honest uh, fleer, that's always good. Yeah? After paying the fare, he went aboard and uh, sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Once again, what's he doing? He's fleeing. The, the writer wants us to know He's running away from God. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And such a violent storm arose that the ship he was on threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. That's standard. That's what they did when the storm was so dangerous that they wanted to survive. But Jonah, who's on this same ship, had gone below deck where he had laid down and fell into a deep sleep. And the captain went down to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. And then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell, unsurprisingly, on Jonah. And so they asked him, tell us, who is it responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? They're basically saying, all our gods are little gods who are to different regions. What region's yours? What is it we have to do to stop him being this way? And Jonah replies, I am a Hebrew. And I worship the Lord, that's Yahweh, the God of heaven, the one who made the sea and the land. You're in the middle of a storm and you hear those words. How do you feel? You see, God is pursuing Jonah. And Jonah tells them that he worships the Lord of all creation. But friends, is he really worshipping the Lord? is he? No. He's not worshipping God. To to worship the Lord, we have to move closer to God, don't we? We we come to here to meet with him, to be in his presence. Jonah is running the entire opposite way. That God wants uh, for, desires for, for Nineveh and for Jonah, he's pursuing him. But, but Jonah is doing everything he can to get away from the presence of the Lord. Not to do what God has asked of him. And friends, we can be like that, can't we? We can proclaim that we follow Jesus, but then our lives do not actually reflect that in how we live it out. 
We can know God's word, but say no to God's word. We can know God's word, but then say no to God's word. See, Jonah here is asked to call on his God to bring about a peace in this storm. But actually, what does he do? Nothing. His concern is still for himself and not for the others. His sin is impacting all those around him, and yet Jonah is soundly asleep in the boat. But let's be real about this too. Because when we're fleeing God, and I'd be amazed if no one's done it, when we're deliberately being disobedient, then the last thing we actually want to do is call on the God we're trying to run away from. You know, even when we know that it's the right thing to do, we can be just as stubborn as Jonah. Agreed? Now, when I used to uh, teach, uh, I had a conflict one day with a teacher. That wasn't unusual. Uh, But on this particular day, I just walked away having not resolved it. Uh, I wasn't fussed about what happened because I was right. Uh, But God had a different plan for me that day. You see, God decided that I really needed to know that although I was right, I hadn't done it the right way. And so he really unsettled me. And so I'm teaching these trumpet students, and all I can actually think about is this conflict I've just had with this other teacher, uh, that I've been rude and that I need to apologise. And so I tried to ignore it, of course. I kept going with my teaching, did other things, did everything I could, basically, to get through the day, and it didn't go away. And uh, to my disappointment, the teacher was still there at the end of the day. Uh, And so I went down to their office, and I I knocked on the door, and I uh, I gave up to God, effectively, and I apologised to this person who just looked me in the face and just went, well, I didn't even know you had been rude to me. (laughs) But you know what I felt? I felt a deep release from the pressure that God had put on me to do the right thing, to follow and be obedient to Jesus. See, God doesn't pursue Jonah to cause him harm as it may first appear. He pursues him out of love to help him to see who he is There is something that Jonah needs to learn about God. And at the moment, Jonah is not ready to listen. Friends, if we're willing, God will work in us and will grow us more like Jesus. But sometimes we go through storms to help us really understand who our God truly is. But it's not just storms which teach us. We've been given God's word. 1 John 2 tells us what we should do. It says, he who says he abides in Christ, or we who say we abide in Christ, ought to walk in the same way as Jesus walked. We are to be those who humble ourselves like Christ. We're to be those who serve like Christ, who love like Christ, who reflect Christ in all that we do, wherever we are, whatever he's called us to. But knowing God's word is only one part, right? We also need God's spirit to enable us to live this way, to change us from the inside out. Friends, if you're trying to do it by your own strength, you are absolutely going to fail. We have to turn and fall on God's mercy and ask his Holy Spirit to work in us. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, William Temple, uh, used a really helpful, I think, uh, uh, explanation to unpack this idea. Uh, And he uses Shakespeare uh, to talk about this. This This is what he says. It is no good giving me a play like Hamlet or King Lear and telling me to write a play like that. Shakespeare could do it. I can't. And it's no good showing me a life like the life of Jesus and telling me to live a life like that. Jesus could do it. I can't. But if the genius of Shakespeare were to come and live in me, then I could write plays like his. And if the spirit could come into me, then I could live a life like Jesus. Friends, God's purpose is for us to become like Christ. And he enables this by filling us, all those who believe, with his Holy Spirit. 
to grow in us good fruit in our lives and to help break off those dead branches and those things that are not of him. Sadly, Jonah doesn't want any part in God's plan. And despite, if you want to look at it, 2 Kings 14, showing us that actually he was a pretty successful prophet, the hatred in his heart for the Ninevites is too great. He wants to go his own way, rejecting God's presence, rejecting the call to live as a light to the nations. What about you? Are you suppressing how God has asked you to live in some areas of your life? Are you deliberately ignoring the word of the Lord? See, friends, God is in the business of being for you and not against you. He doesn't want the ways of this culture to blind you to his ways. He wants you to see who he is and to reflect that to others, to trust in his word even where we struggle with it finding peace in knowing he is Lord over all and that we can trust in his goodness for us. Thankfully for us, God is one who never gives up. Not only pursuing those who don't know his word, but also pursuing those who do know his word, but say no to his word. And in our story, God still isn't finished pursuing people. For we even find now that God is pursuing the sailors. We read on from verse 10. Having heard Jonah's explanation of the Lord as the God of heaven who made the sea and the land, this terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher and so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Well, pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land, but they couldn't, for the sea grew even wilder than before. And then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Notice that the only thing Jonah is interested in is death. He wants the Ninevites dead. He doesn't care about the lives of the sailors. And in the end, he doesn't even care about his own life. Such is his pursuit to get away from God, he is willing to die. But notice how much God cares for these sailors. That although he is continuing to shake Jonah, trying and waiting patiently to get his attention, God doesn't destroy the lives of those around him. In fact, through Jonah's flippant testimony, an almost instant unnatural stilling of the storm occurs. And Jonah's disobedience actually preaches good news to these men as God pursues all those who are far from him. Now, you have to understand that the people who would be reading this text would not see these guys as good guys on this ship. These are non-Jews. These are pagans who, we're told, are actively worshipping idols. God hates those who worship idols and false gods. And yet, in God's mercy, he can work all things together for good. Where Jonah doesn't want a pagan city to hear God's good news, he inadvertently preaches it to a group of pagan sailors instead, moving these men from worshipping idols to worshipping the true God. From a God of wood to the God of creation of land and sea. 
Jonah brings them from death to life in this miraculous encounter. See, through a disobedient prophet, God pursues a group of sailors caught up in Jonah's sin and pours out his mercy on them. And of course, they will then return home with this amazing news. Just think about the wider impact this story is going to have when they tell others of what this God that they have encountered has done in this moment to their family, to their friends, to their neighbourhoods for his glory. And does God still do this? Yes. God still reaches out to those who are having storms in their lives and pursues those who call out to him. He reveals himself in miraculous ways to those who don't even know him and uses us, friends, a real privilege to share his hope with those who are facing darkness in their lives, to help point to his redemption in spite of our own sinfulness and hypocrisy in how we live, that he still speaks life over all who will listen to him and will follow him. Because you see, friends, God is pursuing us all. Nineveh is a lost city full of evil, yet God hears their cries, notices them in his mercy, God pursues them. And Jonah is a disobedient prophet. He's doing all he can to run away from God, to ignore his word. And yet in God's mercy, he pursues him. And these sailors who have really nothing to do with this story other than helping us to see God at work, have an encounter through Jonah's disobedience. They witness a miracle. And because God pursues them, their lives are changed for good. And friends, God is pursuing us. In Jesus, the ultimate prophet, saviour and king, God has made himself known. And in perfect obedience to God's will, as opposed to Jonah, Jesus even chose death on a cross, trusting in God's goodness to make a way for all who believe to be reconciled with him. And the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives in all who will believe. Just think about that. The same power lives in you. That same power is working in you to grow you to be more and more like Jesus because we're saved by grace through faith alone in him. It's in response to that we're called to follow Jesus and to live for him wherever he sends us and in whatever we do. We started by thinking about those things we don't like, those things that we put off at all costs. And they were flippant things that came to our minds. But following Jesus, friends, is not something that should be put off. He wants us to draw near to him. And when we wander, the good shepherd pursues us out of love. And so how about you? Are you running away from his goodness? Or are you running towards him? See, he's lived, he never promises life will be easy. But he does promise to be with us always in all that we go through. To be our strength, our shield, our comfort for all that's before us. To be a faithful God who will hold us fast. And as he pursues you, which way are you running? Are you running towards him or are you running away? Have you got stuck in the mud and you need to start walking again? Do you trust what he reveals in his word, in his living word, that it's for our good, not to harm us, but to prosper us, even when we struggle to agree with what God says. And as God pursues you in all parts of your life, which way are you running? Towards him or away from him? Most of us here have followed Jesus for some time. 
Where do we need to stop resisting? Even being deliberately disobedient. And to ask the Holy Spirit to work in us. To help us follow him. In our workplaces. In our families. In our friendship groups. In our communities. Where do we as a church need Jesus to break into us? To help us to reflect the mercy of God to this town of Warwick, to the places where you belong. Where do we need to see a breakthrough of his spirit so that his light may shine as a beacon of hope out of us, wherever we go and in what we do? Because friends, the Lord has told us what he requires of us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. God's arms are wide open. That's what we're told God is like. The Father waiting for you to run back to him and to feel that loving embrace, knowing that he's never forgotten you. But you have a choice. So which way are you running? You're running towards him? Or you're running away from him? Let go of that rebellion today. Find peace and rest for your soul when you come into the presence of a living God. For his goodness is running after you. running after you receive what he has for you we're going to sing a song which speaks of the goodness of God chasing and running after you if you know it that's great if you don't just let the words wash over you because this is a truth that you need to hear
doesn't leave us, that you are chasing after us, not in a bad way, but in a good way, Lord, a God who doesn't want to leave us, whose arms are wide open and wants us to see him, wants to help us fix our eyes upon Jesus. And Lord, we know that we so often will look elsewhere, that we'll put other things on the throne instead of you, that we'll trust other people instead of you. Lord, help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face, to know that the things of this earth, all those things that tell us that they're more important, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory in the light of his grace. As we come to sing those words, Lord Jesus, of that song, Lord, would you help us to know their truth? As we come to end this time of worship together, Lord, may we see you as the king who reigns over all, who is interested in everything going on in our lives, who is calling us to follow Jesus and help us in those places where we struggle. Lord, where we have been disobedient. Lord, where we know your word, but we're saying no. Help us to seek your face. To trust you. To step into that space. Lord, thank you that your Holy Spirit knows what each of us needs. So help us as we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's sing together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely deep in the King. Okay. 
people in our congregation who are really struggling at the moment, who will find it incredibly hard to sing these words. And what is amazing about God's church is that he draws us together that we might sing them for them, that we might stand with them in their pain, in the challenges that they have before them, in the storms that they are in. It's not that they don't want to hold on to God, they do. But they need us to sing those words even more for them. So I want to invite you to sing that chorus again. And just in your heart, if there's someone you know who is really struggling at this time, can you sing for them? As in their church, as the people who stand with them, let's sing for them this truth that Jesus is there for them too. So we sing together. Jesus, to you we lift our eyes. Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, for Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Lord Jesus, thank you for the way that you're speaking to us today. Thank you for this time we've been able to spend together hearing your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the way that you're speaking into our lives right now. And as we go from this place, Lord, may we not forget what you're saying to us. Lord, if we need to hang around and to meet with the prayer team, to pray about something which is on our hearts, Lord, help us not to fear, but to go there knowing your love waiting, your arms wide open for us. Lord, if we need to spend time with others, praying with them, talking things out, Lord, give us confidence not to flee, but to run towards you. And as a church, Lord, help us to walk closer with you in all that we do throughout this week, to be a beacon of hope in Warwick and beyond, wherever we go. May we clearly see that if Jesus lived our lives, what that might look like. And may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Do stay around uh, to share in fellowship over a, a drink. Uh, the children and young people will turn up at some point. Uh, obviously enjoying themselves far too much. Uh, so, and I'll see you uh, next week, if not before. <laughs>